Pan 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 Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. Continuing our discussion from last week on your forthcoming book, Everything Must Change: Philosophical Lessons from Lockdown, you discussed the idea that the COVID nineteen pandemic could lead to civil disorder, and moreover, and I quote, "There is also the added risk that the economy collapses and it will bring down civil society with it." Why do you think that the pandemic might lead us into a society less state of nature? And what do you think this post society world would actually look like? Or is that perhaps? Overestimating the claim there,、um, slightly overestimating. I mean, obviously, at the time when I was writing the book, we didn't know how long it was going to take for the pandemic to end. You know, there were no、uh, vaccines, and the economy was slowing down everywhere. And and I was just saying, you know, it is not impossible to think of a scenario where you know this is the end of it. But not that I believe that. But I was interested in, and this is where Hobbes comes in.、Mm. I was interested in the fact that it was a moment of crisis, and how do people respond during crisis? And this is a crisis of life and death, which is very much what Hobbes talks about. And I think Hobbes is right when he says that when you are with your back against the wall, you're more likely to act according to your self-interest. And if everyone is just pursuing their self-interest, you know, as a prisoner's dilemma, we know that we don't necessarily make the right decisions. This is where I think. People get Hobbes wrong because people sometimes think that Hobbes is advocating this self-interest. He's not. In fact, he's doing the opposite. He's saying, you know, if you pursue your self-interest, you know, you might get yourself killed. That was the risk with the pandemic. And his solution is, you know, we need cooperation, and cooperation is really important here. On that note, in his most recent book, Humankind, and you mentioned Rutger Bregman. He argues that the life in the state of nature would not be as bad as perhaps you or Hobbes is making out here. And in a time of crisis, we see that human nature is actually more selfless and more altruistic and community-based than self-interested. What do you make of Rutger Bregman's assessment in this book? I wish he was right. I just don't think he is. And again, this isn't black or white. I mean, it's not a question of is everyone altruistic or is everyone selfish. I mean, there are many shades of gray. But why is it that people were hoarding toilet paper and food and pretty much doing whatever was in their interests and not worrying about the others? Even nations, you know, they were undercutting each other in terms of getting PPE equipment, and we see it now with the vaccines. I mean, we are each nation is out for themselves. I want the vaccines first, and screw the rest. It seems to me that the evidence suggests that all this altruism, altruism, is something that you do when you can afford it. Right. So when we had、uh, Stephen Pinker and Rutger Bregman on the show, they debated the two sides of the coin. It was basically a Hobbes versus Rousseau type discussion. And I think Bregman would largely agree with what you're saying there. He thinks that deep down, human nature. Is good, but it's the divisions that arise through engaging and becoming a part of a society that leads to this kind of camaraderie or these injustices or this Hobbesian state of nature played out on the global scale when we all find these individual states and sign those individual social contracts. So, imagine he'd largely agree with you there, but he does seem to have a more optimistic view than you of human nature, doesn't he? When you Pull out of your book his example of the real Lord of the Flies when six schoolboys are shipwrecked. He says, "Well, look what people do in the actual state of nature. These six schoolboys found food. They looked after each other. One fell off a cliff, and they nursed him back to health. And it sounded like they had a lovely little time. It's a beautiful story when we read it. That's the real state of nature," says Bregman. I would be very cautious at generalizing from any one example. I mean、mm-hmm. that's just methodologically very dangerous. So I can think of other historical examples of people indulging in cannibalism as a way of surviving in very extreme circumstances. Just to pull you up on that, that you just said that Bregman can't use one example to make a generalization. Then you just said I can give you some examples. So how can we settle this debate? Because it seems like he's given an anecdote, and you're just going to give us some more stories. How do we determine which one is the true view of human nature? I'm not trying to 
push for a view of human nature mm. as such. I think it depends on the circumstances. And again, I go back to the importance of politics because whether people cooperate or not depends on on the conditions. And if you can create the conditions whereby cooperation is viable, then people are more likely to cooperate. So I think it was really interesting with the first lockdown, partly because it was something new and unlike a protected lockdown where there was an element of fatigue that sets in. Mm -hmm. But certainly with the first lockdown, there was a sense of solidarity yeah. and people wanting to sort of to do their part. And the vast majority of the people were prepared to put up with some sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That's not something you can take for granted. So the fact that you have an advisor to the prime minister that in the middle of a lockdown decides to drive from London to Durham and then to take his wife on her birthday on a scenic route to a castle. Now, that's not just silly. Mm. I think that's bordering on criminal because that undermines any sense of cooperation. You know, mm. why should we put up with those restrictions? when you're not. And if anyone is supposed to lead from the front, it's the politicians. So actually, it's not a question of whether we are acting on the basis of our human nature or not, which will determine things. What will determine things is the context. So any of those scenarios with a different context, it would have been a different outcome. So I'm not suggesting that people will always turn to cannibalism, but given a certain circumstance, it's understandable. The circumstance which you pull out in the book is literally life or death isn't it the one boy gets ill and the two people eat the boy and that's the worst like that's not even state of nature that's like state of hell like it's a horrific circumstance so the context there seems to be the real exception to the rule whereas just to take a quote from Bregman's humankind here the disaster research center at the university of delaware has established that in nearly 700 field studies since 1963 there's never total mayhem it's never every man for himself. Crime, murder, burglary, rape usually drops. People don't go into shock. They stay calm and spring into action. Whatever the extent of the looting a disaster researcher points out, it always pales in significance. I know of no other sociological finding that's backed by so much solid evidence that's so blithely ignored. That's a very different picture to the one you're painting in your book. I know you, you say you don't have a view of human nature, but you did say earlier that disasters bring out the worst in people. But then Bregman says, no, it brings out the best in people. You have people helping each other and, and crime rates drop. They don't go up. I don't accept that at all because we do have the numbers. There is the empirical evidence that domestic violence shot up. There was a huge spike in domestic violence in almost every country, in possibly every country. So at a time when we're a crisis and we're supposed to look after each other within the household, People were turning against the partners. And women have suffered, again, disproportionately from this crisis, publicly, but also in the private sphere. So how would you explain that? Well, when I was reading your book, I wondered what the connection was. Maybe you can flesh it out a little bit here between domestic violence. And I think we should say huge sympathy and, and it's horrific. Some of the statistics that you pull out in the book as well. Here's just one quote from your book. In the UK, the largest domestic abuse charity Refuge reported a 700% increase in calls to its helpline in a single day. And so it's a staggering statistic, isn't it? But it seems that, and maybe Bregman would say something like this, when you're confined to a small building with a number of people, that's very different to the state of nature. The state of nature, as you describe in your book, is one where we're paranoid, one where we're fighting for resources, where there's no communal society or no distributor of the law to maintain that order. But within the household, that seems very different from the, the state of nature. Maybe I'm not explaining that very well, but maybe you can. What's the connection between domestic abuse in the household and that being an indicator of what the state of nature would look like. My point was that just because we're living through an unprecedented crisis, it doesn't mean or we should not assume that people are going to be kind to one another and necessarily look after each other. We know something about domestic violence. We actually don't know because it's very hard to have the numbers with child abuse. And I've been, you know, I was looking into it. We are locked into space. And just when the most vulnerable need special care, mm -hmm. they were being abused. I mean, that's part of what this pandemic was about. 
And it's something that people don't perhaps talk about enough. In third world countries, because it was so desperate, you have a spike of uh, young girls being given up for marriage because that was a way of bringing in money. I appreciate what you're saying. And for me personally, it's more important to focus on victims of what's happening here rather than worrying about the exact cause as to how it's happened as far as human nature is concerned, because it's a direct issue that we can deal with. On that point then, um, I'd like to shift the focus onto solutions, because you do offer, not for specific issues such as that, but on a wider scale with regards to politics, you do give some like policy proposals, I guess. Mm. So you say that there's a necessity for a well-funded public administration, that raising taxes on the wealthy is a necessity as well, and the introduction of a universal basic income. So could you explain why you think that these things are so necessary post the pandemic. Yeah, there was a book that came out in November of last year. So it came out just as I was finishing the book and I just managed to mention it at the very end. Chiara Cordelli, she's a professor in Chicago. The book is called The Privatized State. Mm. And it's a really interesting thesis about how in the last 30, 40 years, more and more state functions have been handed over to the private sphere. Mm -hmm. Private institutions are there for a profit. The state is there, or should be there, to look after the citizens. You know, we have emasculated the public sphere. It's much weaker than it ought to be. And the thing is, during a crisis, people weren't turning to multinationals. People were turning to the state and they were saying, mm. what are you going to do now? Yeah. So this is why I think it's really important to, to analyze this pandemic. It's because there are really important lessons. Now you want the state, but for the last 40 years, you've been voting for politicians that have been cutting your taxes. Now, the state is expensive to run, but we need it. And the most important thing the state does, apart from providing vaccines and PPE and so on and so forth, is that it operates as a coordinating institution. It coordinates our efforts. And that coordination enables the cooperation that will get us through it. And so, in a sense, this is really almost conservative because I'm saying, you know what? We need a better national health service. We need more state. We need more public institutions that will look after people who are vulnerable. If people lose their jobs, well, maybe we should consider something like a universal basic income. These things are expensive. But the fact that in the last 12 months, the very rich got even more rich and the poor got even more desperate. Well, that just suggests that inequality and that injustice that was always part of the system was exposed by the pandemic and made even worse. Let us pause for a wee jiffy to say a quick thank you to the show's patrons for making this episode possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the wheeler dealer inflating the cost of PPE. It's Joe Richardson. Wearing a mask won't help this friendly boy. It's Mr. Jimmy Casperson hurrying to the supermarket to snag all of their toilet rolls. It's Justin Scurry. He'll shoot you if you breach lockdown regulations. It's Zarchery Arnold. Oh, that one's really bad. Sorry, Zach. Getting through the pandemic like a shallow place in a river or stream. It's Mr. Chris Ford. Staying cheery no matter what the wet marketers throw at her. It's Mary Amtabobi. He's already on his third vaccination. He just loves the buzz. It's Neural Surge. He no longer sees the bright side of lockdown. It's Rowan Grayson. And last but not least, his beard is so thick he doesn't need a mask. His arms are so muscular that doctors refuse to vaccinate him. The man whose name strikes fear into the hearts of pandemic conspirators everywhere, Mr. Jim Clare. If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. You've kind of anticipated the answer to this already, but how would you respond to somebody who would say, yes, in times of crisis, it is useful to have a state who can provide this? Because as you correctly point out, it's so important that there's a centralized way of throwing out messages that people can all hear and that things are done quickly through this method. But someone might then just say, but then after the crisis is gone, the best way forward is and always has been, say, like free market, allowing 
the capitalism to do its job and that will grow the economy. And actually, if we run things more through the state and public services, as they tend to be slow and clunky and that will actually hinder progress and make things worse. I mean, what would be the response to that? Yeah, you can't have it both ways. Something like the state and public institutions, you can't just create them with a magic wand. So this idea that, you know, we have this privatized state and then you have a pandemic and all of a sudden, okay, let's bring it back. It doesn't work like that. But apart from that, you know, even without the pandemic, the fact that you have vulnerable people living extremely precarious lives, that's always been there. The fact that the people who die from the pandemic tend to be from certain social classes, from certain ethnic backgrounds, Mm -hmm. that's always been there. So the pandemic possibly has made visible something that was always there, but perhaps people, for whatever reason, were choosing not to see. Crisis will occur. You know, they occur regularly. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there is one certainty, is that there's going to be a crisis. And... I truly believe in politics and I truly believe in a just society, but I do think that a just society needs a public sector. Now, I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on how do we get people to vote for such policies? You already said that as it's happened, people have consistently voted for lower taxes and then big disaster happens and suddenly they're wanting a state that is well-funded and, but of course they can't have both. But the British electorate have really recently voted for a government who are ideologically opposed to everything that you've just been saying there. So I guess I want your thoughts again on what needs to be done to actually get people on side to these ideas. You need to have a government willing to put these policy proposals into practice. How does that actually happen? And do you think that the pandemic will actually inspire that kind of politics? The most spectacular electoral result of the last 12 months was Ardern in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Her party got more than 50% of the votes, which never happens. That's because and only because of the success of her leadership during the crisis. I'm pretty convinced that if it wasn't for the pandemic, Trump would have been reelected, you know, hands down. So I don't think voters are as foolish as sometimes people think. Mm. And actually, the elections in the last 12 months suggest that this pandemic is filtering some voters. Yeah. Moving away from politics and more to political philosophy then, two of the solutions that you do propose are, as we've just mentioned, the increasing of taxes and universal basic income. With the first, the increase of taxes, is an argument to say that what we don't need is to increase taxes, just more smart spending. So we spent like 35 million on the NHS app and millions and billions on nuclear weapons in the UK while people are on the streets starving and and all the other injustices which we see across our society. Do we need to increase taxes? Can't we just spend better? We can always spend better, but there's one reason for increasing taxes is because it's one way of tackling the inequality that we have created. And the inequality is really damaging. It's damaging to democracy. It's damaging to the soul of a society. This is not suggesting that there should be no inequality. It's the scale of inequality. Mm. If we look at the ratio of income between a CEO and the average worker, in the 1950s in America, that was somewhere between 15 and 20, all right? So CEO would earn 15, 20 times more than the average worker. Today, it's 500 times more. And this is America, right? So American 1950s was not a socialist country by any stretch of the imagination. And you can argue that some inequality gives an incentive to be productive. Okay, I buy that. So you can have 10 times, 20 times. Do you need an incentive of 500 times more? That doesn't make sense. And that inequality, it's a cancer to society. So taxation is actually a way to bring it down. So we can be more smart in terms of the way we spend the resources that we have, but actually taxation is a way of tackling inequality and then having a conversation about why inequality is dangerous. That remains to be had. I would like to have a little look at the other proposal you make of universal basic income. Our recent guest on the show, Kahindi Andrews, in his book, The New Age of Empire, has a section where he he looks at universal basic income just as a, a small look at it. I'm just going to give a quotation from him here. 
where he says, eradicating absolute poverty may be a good thing, but universal basic income would actually lock in the logics of empire. Remember, the West only has such a disproportionate amount of wealth because of the poverty in places like Kenya. A world in which a basic universal income is paid for by no borders, where black and brown poor can make money by doing low-paid migrant work in the West, is the definition of a dystopia. Everyone may be able to eat, but the political and economic systems will be frozen in the image of white supremacy and with the underdevelopment world unable to ever catch up. So in a word, universal basic income is only possible because the West benefits so greatly at the expense of Africa. So we have all this money and we can give it out to our citizens, but it's only coming at the cost of others. So is that really justice or is there something else that needs to be looked at there? There is certainly something else that needs to be considered. I mean, there's the whole global justice issue. But that argument is not specifically about basic income. It's about any Western policy. So it applies to basic income and it applies to anything else because the problem here is a global issue. So absolutely, there is a problem, globally speaking, in terms of global justice, in terms of the rich and the poor. That's not going to be addressed by any policy. So it's not specifically about basic income. But I take that point. It doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile discussing domestic policies, which is what universal basic income is. Well, you mentioned Robert Nozick a little bit earlier on. You're not a great fan of, but maybe he can offer a criticism maybe of you on behalf of Kehinde. So Nozick's got that idea of the initial acquisition. So we get like an equal amount of stuff. We distribute it fairly and have these free transactions. And that's a just society. And if an unjust transaction takes place, we need to go back and rectify that. But isn't this Kahindi's point? He says that all those lives lost and all those resources pillaged and still being pillaged now by West and white supremacy, those are unjust transactions. And so universal basic income isn't going to be enough. We're always going to be enjoying the world or existing in a global society, which is built on the, literally on the bones, right, of one of the greatest injustices that could be part of the system of transactions. I imagine there's a Nozickian criticism of universal basic income somewhere there. I do have a lot of time and respect for Nozick, even if I disagree with Nozick. (laughs) And famously, even though he realizes that we need to correct historical injustices, he doesn't obviously tell us how, Mm. because that is almost an impossible question. So I give him credit because he realized taking the, you know, the logic of his argument in that direction, he says, oh, well, yes, then of course, historical injustices, you know, we need to do something about it. What to do about it, it's a different issue that he doesn't tell us. So in a sense, he's also engaging with domestic politics rather than global politics. But the thing about basic income, and there are many different ways of doing it. Personally, I would favor introducing basic income for the 18 to 25 that group first anyway. But I often think the person, uh, even as it happens to be, who stood up and said, I think we need to have a national health service where everyone gets health care, notwithstanding income. Everyone thought that he was just crazy. And everyone, including people in his party. And here we are with the national health service, which seems to be a no-brainer. So a radical idea... (laughs) It's not necessarily wrong just because it seems to be so radical, because the National Health Service was a terribly radical idea. I mean, I grew up in England as a happy. I mean, I spent 20 years in England and coming from from Italy, always admired British society, you know, for things like the NHS. And my heart bleeds to see the way things have turned more recently. We're going to finish off for our final question from us before we look at a few quick fire listener questions. It seems that your political predictions continue to ring true. As a recording, one in four people in higher income countries have received a vaccine compared to one in 500 in lower income countries. Since writing the book, have you been surprised of any of these developments? And as a last question from us, how optimistic are you that we can bring about a fairer world? Am I surprised? No, I think that's exactly what I expected. Can we bring about a more just world? Absolutely. If I didn't think that you could make things better, I would not have bothered with writing the book. I probably wouldn't even bother with teaching political philosophy. 
People think that if you take Hobbes seriously, then you have a very negative conception of human nature and everything is bad and wrong. Absolutely not. I mean, I actually think Hobbes was an optimist because he believed that people can work together and achieve great things. And I do want to believe that. And I still want to believe that. But that's why I want to make sure that the story we tell about this pandemic, it's not, oh, what bad luck that it happened. Okay, we're through it. It will not happen again. Mm. I want to tell the story of look at the injustice that was exposed by the pandemic. Look at the injustice during the pandemic. Let's make sure that doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Let's bring about the changes that are necessary to put us in a different trajectory. So I will keep my optimism, but the optimism is not, let's just trust our human nature because we're really good. No, we really have to work on it. Mm. Thank you to everybody who submitted a listener question for Vittorio. Andrew, I think you've got the first one there. Yeah, from uh, Claire Murphy in the UK. This is slightly less low stakes on, on this one compared to what we've been talking about. <laughs> if you could spend lockdown with one philosopher from the past and one from the present, who would they be and why? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I would love to spend it with Cicero so he could help me to finish the book that I'm writing on Cicero, <laughs> but I'm afraid my Latin isn't good enough for that. <laughs> So that doesn't work. My PhD supervisor, Brian Barry, I miss him. And I would love to actually have a conversation with him. But I don't know if he qualifies because he's not with us anymore. So if the part of the question is, which living philosopher, apart from, you know, Cicero or or Marx, of course, I'm a great admirer of Lea Upi uh, at the London School of Economics. She's written wonderful things on colonialism and on Marxism and She's someone that I always find extremely stimulating and I would always encourage people to read. Our next question comes from René Jorgensen from Denmark, who says, seriously, how do you know there is a pandemic? With my emphasis on how, this is a very serious epistemological problem no one seems to be able to answer. Remember, no one can give you knowledge you have to get it yourself. Wow. How do we know that we have a pandemic? Here's the crux, I think. No one can give you knowledge. You have to get it yourself. So there is an assumption here that knowledge comes from experience as opposed to from testimony. But I would actually turn the table and argue that 90% of the things I know, I don't know from experience. I know because Mm. I've read them in a book or someone has told me about it. So yes, I trust that there is a pandemic out there from what people have told me. Our final question here from Akhilish Singh in India, who says, we know the path, but we don't know how to travel that path. Like, I know how to do my job, but the inner fire is missing. How can philosophy be helpful in this matter? So I guess a question about purpose. I think most of us, I think we all have the philosophy bug and there is no virus for it, which is good. (laughs) We probably got into philosophy because we were looking for answers Mm. or because of a curiosity that was spurring us on. And personally, I think philosophy gives me purpose. So, you know, if I read books and books and books on social justice and a just society, it's because I do want to make things better and make a contribution. So philosophy, yes, helps. So a round of concluding remarks as we finish up here. Andrew, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, th- first of all, thanks so much, Vittorio, for coming and, uh, and chatting us with us today. Uh, it's very much appreciated. I found your book really interesting because, as with you and I suspect anybody who's into philosophy, is you do think about these things as events are happening and making sense of it. And as far as I'm aware, you're the first person to write a book <laughs> about the pandemic from a philosophical perspective. And so there were certain chapters that I thought were really interesting, made me want to read more on them. And we, which, and even ones that we didn't even get a chance to speak about today. So in particular, the bit that you talk about with violence is something that I would love to read on more. So thank you for just inspiring me with loads of little bits of philosophy that come through and make it relevant for today. Well, thank you, Andy. That's wonderful. I think if you write something that can inspire people to go on and read more, I think you've done your job. I did rely on a lot of things that I had done in the past. So I wrote a book on violence and the philosophy of violence. Not many people write about violence and philosophy, but that was always in the back of my mind. And so I'm glad that I had a chance to actually bring that in. Yeah, I want to emphasize all of what Andy said as well. I really, really enjoyed 
reading the book itself. And as I wrote to you recently and said, I think it's an example of just how good and important public philosophy can be. Right back to our conversation at the start. People don't think public philosophy is real philosophy. Well, it's literally changing the world for the better and focusing on issues that are literally taking millions of people's lives. Call it philosophy or not, like whatever you like. This is a, it's a hugely important book. And I think something which anybody from any age group or worldview can pick up and read and engage with and, and learn some really important things about social justice from there. It's been great to speak to you today about it as well and to, to pick your brain on some of the issues which you go away and think about. It's a really short text. And so I think if you're worried about being overloaded with information about the pandemic, listeners, don't be concerned because Vittorio guides you through eight great little lessons, which you just walk off afterwards and think, you're jogging with me your head, you bring them in conversation. So it really inspires those, those future conversations. What will go away and think about? Well, I'm excited for your second edition of the book already in which you talk about non-human animals <laughs> and the climate emergency. So uh, I look forward to, to that Basically, one Basically, Jax just wants you to have written the book for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> I've been asked why I bother with public philosophy, and there are many different answers, but this is one. I get paid by taxpayers as a university lecturer. And yes, I do the teaching, but I always feel that if I can write something that only a handful of philosophers are going to read in some obscure journal, I should be able to take exactly the same argument and write it in a language that everyone can understand. Mm. And that's how I started writing op-eds for newspapers. There was a sense of duty at the back mm -hmm. saying, I have to give something back, which is not just to my students, but I'll just put it out there. You know, I did five years of research on this one article. Well, some philosophers read it, but there is one simple idea. I should be able to say that. Well, you might regret getting into public philosophy as a whole with our final installment, Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop pop pop, 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 Philosophy quiz. So we're playing, oh, this might be the worst one we've ever done. Victoria, I'm really, really sorry, but <laughs> it was so difficult to find anybody who people will know who resembles uh, your name. So we've got, oh, this is really bad. Should we even do it? Volterio Rusbarkley or <laughs> Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got quotes from. Voltaire, the French Enlightenment writer, historian, and philosopher, to Voltaire. We've got Russ Barclay, as in Ross Barclay, born in 1993. He's currently on loan at Aston Villa FC, football player in the UK. And then we've got Vittorio Bufaki, senior lecturer in philosophy at University College Cork. So you've got Voltaire, Barclay, or Vittorio. Okay? Fastest finger first. I'm going to give you the quotes, uh, whoever's there gets the point. We're not playing at teams. This isn't, this is the free market. This isn't a collective good. <laughs> rights, not duties. It is love, love, the comfort of the human species, the uh, preserver of the universe. It's Voltaire. Well done, Andrew. Whoa, rights play a crucial role in modern politics and ethics and rightly Vittorio. so. It's Vittorio. That's... <laughs> It's 2-0 to Andrea. Yeah, Victoria, you've got, to, you've got to beat him. I was, I was actually trying to decide whether I agree with that statement or not, knowing that it was my own quote. <laughs> with each individual, everybody takes instructions in a different way. Uh, I'll go Barclay. It's Barclay. You're getting yeah. destroyed here, Victoria. Happiness is seeing your tomatoes turn red. Oh, that's me. <laughs> that's 3-1. Uh, but see, that's going back to having a garden and a library, uh, <laughs> yeah. the tomatoes. Common sense is not so common. Voltaire. Voltaire, that's 4-1. But I usually have a bit of pesto, either spaghetti or panne. I would love if that was Voltaire. <laughs> it's not Voltaire, so no, it... I think that's Barclay. It's Barclay, well done. On game day, I'll add a bit of meat and maybe have right. some greens, he finishes the quote. The Holy Roman Empire is neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Voltaire. Voltaire, that's 4-3. You can, you can level it here. Maybe we'll end up with a leftist at the end of it. We're running out of jokes there. The last courgette on the 1st of November, biblical gardening. Vittorio. Of course. It's no. Vittor that's Vittorio. There you go, Andrew. Well done. Is that did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you did now. <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode, <laughs> then you can find links to Vittorio's website and all of his work on thepansycast.com or in the iTunes description. There you can also find a link to his brilliant new popular philosophy book, Everything Must Change, 
Philosophical Lessons from Lockdown, which comes highly recommended by myself and Andrew. Last but not least, thank you to all of our patrons for supporting the show. Remember, we need to reach 200 patrons by episode 100. If you're not already supporting the show, then work towards the collective good. Go to patreon.com forward slash pansidecast. Our beautiful pansidecast mugs are now available there too, as well as early access to next week's interview with William Lane Craig. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, beautiful, soothing voices of Mr. Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Dr. Vittorio Bufaki. Thank you for inviting me. And me, Mr. Andrew Horton. Thank you for listening. Guys, thank you so much. This is so much fun. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. You do this every week.